Today is April 13, 2017, and we are in the middle of the night in the Passover vigil. So before we get into this aspect of our study, let's ask our Heavenly Family to bless us. Heavenly Family, thank you so much for the truth that you have for us. Thank you for deliverance and love and showing us a new way, a new kingdom. And also, thank you for this memorial of the Exodus. Please help us to understand it better. Help us to gain a clear view and to understand the principles of investigation. Thank you so much. Please guide us, sister. We ask this, B'Shem Tzemach, in the name of Branch. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, um, did you guys get the link that I posted on Facebook for the, uh, the book of Exodus according to the various sources? We actually didn't I go didn't to the Facebook. Sorry. Remember my password for Facebook, and the automatic thing seemed to have quit working on my computers. Okay, so it sounds like Leroy didn't get it, and I wasn't able to make it out. Ed, did you say you guys didn't go to it either? We did not. He said it was on the branch. Yeah, on the branch. Facebook page. Yeah, it's on the the branch Facebook page. So there's the group in the page, and it's on the page. It's on the page. Um, I will say though that I went and looked at it and compared it to this book, the Bible with sources revealed, which is the same thing in principle, and some of it is the same, but some of it is different, and I don't know. Like, I don't know what the source for the Wikipedia page is. So, like, where did they get it? Is it mistakes? The, the color coding is a little bit harder to follow, I think. Um, but maybe that's just the format. It's hard for me to say for sure. But um, in any case, so I don't know if any of you guys have this book, The Bible with Sources Revealed by Richard Elliott Friedman, but it has it color coded according to sources. Um, and footnotes and, and different things like that. So we'll we'll see. I will, I'll probably go based off of this book just because I think it's probably more reliable. It's the one that most historians recommend for understanding the documentary hypothesis. And to a certain extent, it'll be easy to follow with the online edition. But maybe not entirely. The other option is to just follow along in whatever Bible you have, and I'll just tell you the different verses as we go through and read it. That's another way to do this. Um, but before we get into actually uh, reading these things, I just wanted to check if there are... And, you know, actually, I'll probably explain a little bit more about what this is, or at least give a brief nutshell or recap about the documentary hypothesis and reading it and the benefits of reading it in the separate sources. Um, but before that, I just want to ask if anyone has comments or questions, either in regard to what we have discussed in our previous meeting or in regard to what we are about to go through in Exodus. So anyone? Okay, so it does not sound like there are any questions or comments. So I won't go and recap the whole documentary hypothesis itself, but 
I'll mention the basic idea is that there are different sources that make up the Pentateuch. In other words, the five books of Moses, as they are traditionally called, were actually originally at least four independent narratives that were subsequently stitched together by various editors. And the, the traditional view of the documentary hypothesis is that the four main sources are J, which is the Yahwist source, E, which is the Eloist source, P, the priestly source, and D, the Deuteronomist. And so, as Richard Elliot Friedman puts it, J, E, P, and D wrote the B, I, B, L, E. <laughs> That's a, an easy way to remember it. J, E, P, and D wrote the B, I, B, L, E. So that's, that's the, uh, the basic idea. Um, just brief recap on the sources themselves. J and E are supposed to have been written at about the same period of time. That is between 922 and 722 BCE, before the Common Era. So that's the period of the divided kingdom. That's after the death of Solomon, but before the Assyrian Empire scattered the Ten Tribe Kingdom. So both J and E, and they are uh, supposed to be the earliest sources of the Pentateuch in terms of the four main sources. There is material that is earlier, such as the Song of Miriam, and the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, and even a section in Deuteronomy. Um, but as far as the main narrative sources, J and E are understood to be the earliest. J was written in the Southern Kingdom, and E was written in the Northern Kingdom. And then the hypothesis goes that when the Ten tribes were scattered by the Assyrian. Some people from the Ten Tribe Kingdom fled south, which is certainly factual, and they entered into the Kingdom of Judah, and someone brought a copy or multiple copies of the E source. <laughs> and of course, they didn't know it as the E source, they called it by whatever. what is now called J and what is now called E, and combined them together. Because they were very similar, but also had some major differences. And what do you do with that? You can't just get rid of one telling of the history of Israel, because it's popular. You know, both of them are liked and are popular, and you, you kind of, you can't do without them. But also just keeping them both as separate accounts, the apparent discrepancies might be an issue. And so how do you keep them without possibly discrediting both? Well, one way is to combine them. So that's the idea, that they were then combined to create a, an account which is known as RJE. R means redactor or editor and RJE is the combined or edited version of J and E together. And then the hypothesis says that sometime in the days of Hezekiah or thereabouts, the P source was written, which is the priestly account of the same history, which was an alternative to the JE combined story. And then about uh, a couple generations later, in the days of Josiah, an old scroll was found in the temple, uh, which is a scroll of the law of Moses, and it forms the core of what is known as Deuteronomy. And then some people in Josiah's day added an introduction and an end to it, and uh, 
that ended up being the book of Deuteronomy as we have it. So that's the basic rundown of the essentials of the documentary hypothesis, although, of course, there's more than that. But those are the essentials just to give you guys the idea. So here's the thing. The book of Exodus, most people, in opening up the Bible and reading it, look at the book of Exodus as one book. And so they'll judge what it says as being one book. But if the documentary hypothesis is true, and even if not all of the different aspects of when each source was written and by whom and where and the dates and all that, but even just the basic idea of the, the Pentateuch being written by multiple individuals at different times and then being combined, which I definitely believe is true, if that's the case, then we can't judge it as one book because it is not. And so we have to study it according to the original sources before they were combined as best as can be reconstructed in order to judge each document on its own merits. And of course this is really important because each writer may have had a different perspective on things. Just like with the Gospels in the New Testament. We have four Gospels in the New Testament and people often view them as one big combined account. They combine everything together and don't look at what each writer has to say for himself. And the individual message of each author gets lost. So most people don't recognize Mark's message as distinct from Matthew's message and Luke's message and John's message. John maybe is a little bit easier because it's different from the three others. But still, for most people, it's all viewed as one combined account. Well, interestingly enough, in the second century of the Common Era, there is a guy named Tatian who actually compiled those Gospels into something known as the Diatessaron. And in certain Syrian churches, the Diatessaron actually took over and became more popular than the four Gospels themselves. And it's actually uh, a possibility, like it, it could have happened, that the Diatessaron, the combined account of the gospel, was one all over the world, and people would have just copied it and no longer copied the gospels as independent sources. And then we would just have this one gospel that's really a combination of the others, but people might have forgotten that it's a combination over century upon century upon century. Well, the documentary hypothesis basically says that that's what happened with the Pentateuch, that it was independent sources, then it was combined together, kind of like a gospel harmony, and there's actually been many gospel harmonies. The Dea Tesseron was the first one. But even today, people make gospel harmonies where they take all these elements from the various Gospels and compile it together in different ways to make a harmony of the Gospels. So the Pentateuch as we have it is a harmony of various independent writings which tell the story of basically the, from the creation of the world until the days of Moses. And some of the sources actually go beyond that. Um, Richard Elliott Friedman has argued that the J source spans until the kings, and his other historians have long recognized that the Deuteronomy source spans seven or eight books. So it is actually, it's called the Deuteronomistic history. And that also goes through, you know, Joshua Judges, Ruth, um, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and uh, but it includes some of the things from the J source. So there's a lot of study that has gone into this, and 
one of the things that's really useful about this book, The Bible with Sources Revealed, is that the first 32 pages are a condensed collection of evidence in favor of the documentary hypothesis. And I'll mention some of the things that it says here without going and just reading the whole thing. But I'll mention just so that you guys can have some sort of idea as to what the evidence is in favor of this. So there's seven main arguments. The first one is linguistic. So here's the thing. Archaeologists have actually found many Hebrew inscriptions and writings from basically every century BCE from the 11th century up until the 1st century BCE, enough where they're able to actually chronicle the development of the language. And then you have texts that you can certainly date to different periods. So, for example, some of the texts in the Dead Sea Scrolls were definitely composed, as in the actual writing itself was composed, written, authored in the 2nd century BCE. Well, that helps you a lot to know what the language was like at that time. But then there are other writings which you can show were written in the 10th century BCE, like some of the Psalms. And there are other writings written in different times. And so you have those writings plus the inscriptions, so you're able to tell when different things were written. And then if you have a new writing, let's say, that you aren't familiar with, you can compare the actual language with the Hebrew of these various stages and identify at least roughly to which century or at least which period it belongs. So you can say, oh, was this before the Babylonian exile or after the Babylonian exile? Things like that. And so when these sources are separated, J, E, P, and D, what you find is that J and E come from the earliest linguistic source, or linguistic phase, I should say, of Hebrew. P comes from a later stage, and D comes from a still later stage. Well, that'd be kind of odd if it was all written by one person at one time for all of these sections of it to reflect different stages of the Hebrew language, especially seeing that that takes place with doublets of stories. So again, that's one of the main ways that the documentary hypothesis was, in a sense, discovered. People notice, oh, well, there are all these repeated stories. What's that all about? So anyways, linguistic is the first thing. Uh, The second line of evidence is terminology. That being that each source has certain phrases that occur only in it, and often many times. So, for instance, uh, the phrase, be fruitful and multiply, occurs 12 times, and all of them are in the P source. And then you have phrases like, the place where Yahweh sets his name, or the place where Yahweh tents, his name, different things like that. It occurs ten times, always in D, never in the other sources. There's many, many uh, terms like that where there are occurrences of a certain phrase or a certain term, and it's totally um, disproportionately placed in one source over the others. So... Uh, For instance, the word chieftain occurs 69 times in the Torah, 67 are in P, the other two are in J and E. Well, I mean, yeah, okay, there's a little bit of overlap, but it's totally disproportionately in one over the other. And so there are many of these terms that occur like that, and some of them are you know, a hundred times or so in one source and not at all in the others. So, I mean, that would be characteristic of different authors. A different author may use a certain term and so on. Okay, now, the next line of evidence is consistent content. So, throughout the J source, 
the name Yahweh is revealed basically from the beginning of the story. Whereas in uh, P and E, the name Yahweh is not revealed until the, the uh, time of Moses. So that's kind of different. That's consistent within each source, but kind of discrepant across them or between them. Um, other consistent things in, in terms of terminology, I won't go through other examples. Another line of evidence is the continuity of the texts, otherwise known as the narrative flow. In other words, when you separate the sources and you read J straight through, ignoring all the E material, the P material, and the D material, J flows naturally as a narrative source going straight through. Then if you take E and you read E all the way through and ignore J, P, and D, E is one consistent flowing narrative. Then you take P and you read it through, and it's one consistent flowing narrative. You take D and you read it through, it's one consistent flowing narrative. I mean, that to me is one of the strongest evidences in favor of this idea. Another line of evidence is connections with other parts of the Bible. So, for instance, Jeremiah has a strong connection with D. Jeremiah quotes phrases and terms and, and verses from D, but not from the other ones so much. Well, why would that be? Well, perhaps it's because it was a separate document and he had that document as a separate document rather than the combined Pentateuch as we have it. Another one is Ezekiel and P. Ezekiel deals with P a lot, but not so much with the others. And there's really no evidence that Ezekiel or any of these prophets had the combined Pentateuch. Yet, it kind of does look like Ezekiel has P. And actually... Uh, there's one historian named William Prop, and he has argued that P actually is quoted by Ezekiel in a, a rather extraordinary fashion. And because how would you tell, let's say, if Ezekiel quotes the original P source versus just quoting the Pentateuch as we have it today? Well, for instance, if you have a place in our current Pentateuch where you have P material, and then it's interrupted by J material, and it goes back to P. Well, if we were going to quote that passage, we would have P material, then J material, then P material. But if Ezekiel had that passage, he would just have the P material straight through without the J interrupting it. And William Prop has argued uh, that he actually does quote the P material uninterrupted, as in without the other sources in it. Well, if that's the case, that's a very strong evidence that Ezekiel had this priestly source document without it being combined with the others. Also, there's the court history of David in Second Samuel, and that has a strong relation with, with J. So there's different things like that. Okay, another line of evidence is the relationships among the sources to each other and to history. And this one, uh, to each other, is a bit more complicated, but to history is quite extraordinary. So, for instance, if you look at J, it's supposed to be from the Southern Kingdom. And when you read just the J material without reading the others, the geography is in the southern kingdom, the terms, the, the references to various people, like it focuses on Judah, for instance. Judah is the one who really helped Joseph in the J story. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on things that relate to the southern kingdom. Whereas in the E material from the northern kingdom, there's not an emphasis on Judah or on southern kingdom geography. It's actually the places that it refers to are within the northern kingdom. It's northern kingdom geography. And it talks about the blessing upon Ephraim and all these other things having to do with the ten tribes and refers to the other patriarchs. And, and it was Benjamin. Uh, I think it was uh, 
no, it was Reuben, sorry, Reuben in the E story that really helped Joseph the most. So in our story, we have it combined where they both kind of help. That's just because it's a combination of these two sources. So those are things that it's like, okay, well, that's actually how historians came to conclude that, well, J must have been written in the south, E must have been written in the north, because their references are to the geography of those two respective locations. So that's one of the other lines of evidence. And, of course, P has uh, material that focuses on the priests, whereas the others don't so much. And there, are, there are other elements, but I'll skip over a lot of stuff. And the seventh line of evidence is the convergence of all the various points of data, which make it one harmonious theory, as it were. Not theory as in just a random idea, but theory as in a working hypothesis. Uh, like, like we talked about before, in science, a theory isn't just someone's random idea. It is a hypothesis that has been tested and tested and tested and not disproved, and also having um, demonstrable predictive uh, capability. In other words, oh, well, if this is true, then we should be able to look here and observe that. And then you look there and you actually observe that. So it works as a model and uh, seems to line up with everything. So those are the basic evidences for the documentary hypothesis. Of course, that's just me telling you guys about them rather than going through them in detail. But that's the basic idea. So in reading through the Exodus story, what I would like to do is read through it according to each source and do it in the proposed order of date. So historians typically think J and E were written first. Some would say J is a little bit earlier. So we'll read J first. And then we can read E. And then we can read P. Those are the three sources in this Exodus account. D is not part of it. D is basically just in Deuteronomy. So that's, that's the idea, to start with uh, J, then go to E, then go to P. So, uh, like I said, I'll tell you the verses that we're at. Uh, we'll start with J material and we may have other people reading some of it too, and people on this end, and also perhaps if you guys want to read some, I could just tell you from which place to which place. Um, but at the beginning, since it, it connects back to things in Genesis, I'll, I'll mention a few things in order to kind of connect it. Okay, so the first J verse in Exodus is chapter 1, verse 6. And this is how it reads. And Heavenly Family, bless us as we read these stories. Help us to really understand what they are about as independent from each other. Actually, you know what? Before I read this, there is another element that I should mention, actually. What historians hope for in doing history is to have multiple independent accounts of certain events. It helps them to verify what actually happened. Just like at a crime scene, if you have multiple independent people, as in they're not depending on, the, on each other for their information, multiple people who are independent of each other, and they're telling the same story, but... Perhaps there's slight differences or whatever. Red coat instead of a blue coat. <laughs> sure, yeah. But that helps a whole lot to know what happened. So in reading the Pentateuch in its different sources, this can help us to know what really happened. Maybe there's going to be some stuff that we'll find, oh, this is not historically verifiable. But maybe this will help us to really verify certain things. So 
anyway, I just wanted to mention that as a a huge benefit to reading the Pentateuch according to these different sources. And uh, so anyways, are you guys all good? Are you ready to get into this? Or are there questions or comments before we do? We're all ready to get into it. Ready. Okay, excellent. Awesome. We're ready here too. <laughs> okay. So Exodus chapter 1 verse 6. This is the J source. And Joseph and all his brothers and all of that generation died. Okay, so the idea is that Exodus originally wasn't one book Exodus. So it didn't start at the beginning of Exodus or in verse 6 or anything like that. It wasn't divided into five books. So this actually just naturally flows with what came before. So, I'll go and read a few things from earlier in J, going back to the end of Genesis, and then going into this. And what I'm going to read is Genesis 50, verse 14, and then Genesis 50, verse 22, and then Exodus 1, verse 6. And I'm going to read them uninterrupted just so you can hear the flow. But that's what it is. If you guys want to follow, it's Genesis 50, verse 14, then verse 22, and then Exodus 1, verse 6. So this is what it says. And after his burial of his father, Joseph came back to Egypt he and his brothers and all those who went up with him to bury his father. And Joseph lived in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived a 110 years. And Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. So that was those three verses, and of course, they flowed very well together <laughs> without, any, without any problems. So that's just to get into the narrative flow. And uh, I'll just read chapter 1, verse 6 of Exodus again, and then I'll immediately go to verse 22. And Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. And Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall throw into the Nile and every daughter you shall keep alive. Okay, so notice how that one goes immediately from the death of Joseph and all his brothers to Pharaoh saying, okay, every son that is born shall die by being thrown into the Nile. So notice it's kind of a different picture when it's just that one source read independently. Um, so to continue on this source... It's from chapter 2, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 23, uh, at least up until a certain part of 23. So maybe I'll ask someone to read this, and whoever is going to read it, uh, if someone wants to volunteer, let me know, and then I'll tell you which part of 23 to go up till before you start reading. So does anyone want to volunteer to read it? I will. This is, um, you said to start in 2-1, I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, you can start in uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And then we're going to go and, to 23. Yeah, to 23. And this is the part of 23 that's part of this source. Um, in verse 23 it says, And it was after those many days, and the king of Egypt died. Period. And that's, that's the point where the J source stops according to this. Okay. We actually have one okay. of the, the books, the Bible, with sources revealed. So. Oh, you do? Yep. Excellent. Okay, well that should make it easier then. I'm glad that you have the book. <laughs> 
Okay, cool. Feel free to read when you're ready. And a man from the house of Levi went and took a daughter of Levi. And the woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And she saw him, that he was good. And she concealed him for three months. And she was not able to conceal him anymore. And she took an ark made of bulrushes for, for, for him and smeared it with bitumen and with pitch and put the boy in it and put it in the reeds by the bank of the Nile. And his sister stood still at a distance to know what would be done to him. And the Pharaoh's daughter went down to bathe in the Nile and her girls were going alongside the Nile. And she took the ark among the reeds and sent her maid and she took it. And she opened it and saw him, the child. And there was a boy crying and she had compassion on him. And she said, this is one of the Hebrews children. And his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nursing woman from the Hebrews for you? And she'll nurse the child for you. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse him for me, and I'll give your pay. And the woman took the boy and nursed him. And the boy grew older, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him from the water. And it was in those days, and Moses grew older, and he went out to his brothers and saw their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian man striking a Hebrew man, one of his brothers. And he turned this way and that way and saw there was no man. And he struck the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And he went out the second day, and there were two Hebrew men fighting. And he said to one who was in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? And he said, Who made you commander and judge over us? Are you saying you'd kill me the way you killed the Egyptian? And Moses was afraid and said, The thing is known for sure. And Pharaoh heard this thing and sought to kill Moses. And Moses fled from Pharaoh's presence and lived in the land of Midian. And he sat by a well, and a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs of water in her father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away. And Moses got up and saved them and watered their flock. And they came to Ruel, their father, and said, Why were you so quick to come today? And they said, An Egyptian man rescued us from the shepherd's hand, and he drew water for us and watered the flock too. And he said to his daughters, Where is he? Why is it that you've left this man? Call him and let him eat bread. And Moses was content to live with the man. And he gave Zipporah, his daughter, to Moses. And she gave birth to a son, and she called his name Gershom, because he said, I'm an alien in a foreign land. And it was after those many days, and the king of Egypt died. Okay, thank you. Um, so, of course, that all flowed perfectly fine, as it would just reading it in the uh, combined Pentateuch, as we have it, just because it's all verse after verse after verse. But it's, this is letting us know the content of this source. And uh, there is a footnote here in chapter 2, verse 4. And this is what it says. The sister is not identified as Miriam here. Her name is not given. In J, E, and D, Miriam is not identified as Moses' sister, and Aaron is not identified as Moses' brother. Only in P are they said to be Moses' siblings. So that's an interesting aspect. Um, so here there's 
no mention of who this is, his sister, but there's no name given. And evidently throughout the J source, there's no connection. Also, the E source and the D source. Only in P are Moses' uh, siblings said to be Aaron and Miriam. Kind of interesting. Another footnote, actually, even though in the... Bible sources revealed, this is actually a footnote on chapter 3, verse 1, which we have not read yet, and that is an E source. The footnote is relevant to something that we just read. The footnote says, Moses' father-in-law, priest of Midian, is named Jethro in several verses that are all E, but is named Ruel, in Exodus 2, verses 16 to 18, and Numbers 10, 29, and that's J. So, I don't know if you guys noticed that before. We Usually we call him Jethro, because that's just, that one became more popular. But in these two places, he's referred to not as Jethro, but as Ruel. And actually, it, with the documentary hypothesis, those are in separate sources. So in other words, one account... The J account says his name was Ruel, but the E story says his name was Jethro. So, interesting things to keep in mind. So, um, this continues on into several parts. Um, this also may be easier for someone with the book, whether someone here reading it or someone over in Michigan who has the book, unless someone else has the book and I don't know it, but if someone has the book Bible of Sources Revealed, this next uh, section might be easier simply because there is one place where it's only part of a verse. Um, but can, someone could I read... I can keep reading if you want, and I'll just... Um you know, call out the name or the uh, the number of the verse, or the chapter and the number. You know, we'll start with a chapter, and then I'll call each each number within that chapter. Um, before yeah, I let's it. try. Let's try that this first time and see how it flows. I know. Uh, it'll be interesting. We can we can try that. One thing that I would hope that wouldn't that that wouldn't do is to kind of interrupt the flow because one of the things that's powerful about this is seeing the flow and seeing how seamless it is. Like, th like there's been times where uh, I've read a different section from a certain source to Teresa and not told her that, you know, I'm skipping from place to place to place and just and asked her just to find out what she really thought. Like, hey, does that sound like it's a continual flow? And she's like, yeah, totally. Um, but maybe it won't really interrupt it enough. But let's let's test it out and see how that goes. Maybe you can start from uh, start by reading the first part of verse twenty three again. Okay. And then and then go reading only the J source up until the end of chapter three verse eight. Okay. All right. Okay, um, cool. So this is chapter 2, verse 23. That will be the last verse from chapter 23. I'm sorry, from chapter 2. And it was after those many days, and the king of Egypt died. Chapter 3, verse 2. And an angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a fire flame from inside a bush. And he looked, and here the bush was burning in the fire. And the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, let me turn and see this great sight. Why doesn't the bush burn? And Yahweh saw that he turned to see. And then we're skipping some of verse 4 and moving on to verse 5. And he said, don't come close here. Take off your shoes from your feet because the place on which you're standing is holy ground. Verse 7 and Yahweh said, I've seen the degradation of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their wail on account of the taskmasters, because I know their pains. 
and I have come down to rescue from Egypt's hand and to bring them up from the land to a good and widespread land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Jebusite. That's the end of verse 8. Okay, excellent. Now, I'd like to ask someone who's not following along looking at this in a color-coded way, um, whether you're just listening or following along in a regular Bible, um, just because I was following along looking at it. So for me, it flowed fine. But I just wanted to ask you guys, did that flow well for you? Uh, or do you think it'd be better to have it read without stating the verse numbers? You know, I, I, I just want feedback on that from people so we can know the best way to go about it. Well, it seemed to flow okay, and, and that way I was able to jump to the next verse, you know, when he called it out. I could follow it. What was the other suggestion of another way to do it? Well, the other way would be that whoever's reading would tell ahead of time the verses that they were going to read and then just read it straight through without saying that they're jumping okay. ahead to a certain verse when they are. Yeah. You know, that might be a little bit more complicated because if you want to follow along, you might have to write them down or something when it's said ahead of time. I just put um, a, so I just, I'm sorry, I just put a pencil mark beside the one that you said, and then I just went to it. But it, it certainly doesn't matter to me. I just, I was able to follow it either way, so. Okay, cool. Um, anyone else? I was just listening, and it seemed like it followed along real good. Okay. Um, so, I mean, if, if you guys want to continue it like that, I'm fine with, with uh, mentioning the verses. It didn't really seem like it interrupted it much to me or anything. What did you think, Teresa? I thought it went okay. Yeah. You guys? Yeah? Okay. Everyone seems cool with that, so if you guys want to continue that way. It doesn't seem like people mind one way or the other. Uh, yeah, just reading the verses before jumping ahead, you know. So. Did it interrupt the narrative flow for you? Okay. Okay, people are good either way. Um, so let's try and keep note of the content as well, like the actual flow of what happens. And maybe someone would actually like to write this down. And just like the main points of what is described. So let me ask, is there anyone who could volunteer to do that? And I'll, I'll recap what we've gone through so far. And then after we read each section, we can recap the points. And someone can just write them down in order. You know, this happened, and this, and this. You can just have a list. You know, Joseph and brothers died. And then the next thing, and then the next thing. And that way, after, when we go through each source, we can compare them. So would someone like to volunteer to do that? Okay, Teresa is volunteering. And if anyone else wants to as well, that'd be cool. And you might end up wanting it for your notes even. Okay, so let me know when you're ready and I'll start to recap these various points. This is a good experiment for us all to do. Ready. Okay, so this is J, the J source. So the first point is that Joseph and his brothers died. That's the first thing that happens. Second thing is Pharaoh's decree to kill the sons. Second, or sorry, third thing that happened is that uh, 
Moses was born, hid, and I guess maybe the word adopted to work. And let's see. Next thing is Moses kills the Egyptian. Next thing is that Moses flees to the land of Midian. And, you know, I'm just going to give the high points without giving the details. Uh, and then you could say, the next thing is he marries Zipporah. and has a son, Gershom. Next thing is Pharaoh dies. Next thing is uh, Moses at the burning bush. Let's see. And next, Yahweh tells him that he will deliver Israel. Okay. So those are the points so far that we have covered. Um, Next, I think it would be good to read the J material. And I think we can start with um, rereading verse 8 of chapter 3 and then going from there to verse 19 of chapter 3 and reading that whole, you know, the rest of that chapter and then going to verse 19 of chapter 4 and reading verses 19 and 20 there because those are the next, the next part of this. Um, and then after reading those three segments of J, we'll do the footnotes after. I think that'd be good to do. How does that sound? Sounds good. Awesome. Whenever you're ready, then. Okay, chapter 3, verse 8. And I've come down to rescue them from Egypt's hand and to bring them up from the land to a good and widespread land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Going to verse 19. And I know that the king of Egypt won't allow you to go and not by a strong hand. And I'll put out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders that I'll do among them and after that, he'll let you go. And I'll put this people's favor in Egypt's eyes, and it will be when you go. You won't go empty-handed, and each woman will ask for silver articles and gold articles and clothes from her neighbor and from anyone staying in her house, and you'll put them on your sons and on your daughters, and you'll, de and you'll despoil Egypt." Moving on to chapter 4, verse 19. And Yahweh, said, and Yahweh said to Moses and Midian, Go, go back to Egypt, because all the people who sought your life have died. And Moses took his wife and his sons and rode them on an ass, and he went back to the land of Egypt. Okay, excellent. That all flowed very well, don't you guys think? Yep. yep. Well, well, eh? 
Okay, interesting. Okay, so the footnotes, there's a couple of them here. Um, at the end of chapter 3, verse 22, it says, The account of the despoiling of Egypt appears in words very similar to these in Exodus 11, 1 to 3, and Exodus 12, 35 to 36. But those two passages are embedded in E contexts, whereas the present passage is joined to a J context. The identification of these three passages is therefore uncertain. Okay, so he's expressing some uncertainty as to the identification of these. Of course, this flowed very well, so I guess we'll see as we continue. The next footnote is after the word sons in uh, Exodus chapter 4, verse uh, 20, and they actually have sons. The S in sons is actually uh, highlighted to be part of RJE, which is the edited combined version of J and E. And what it says in this footnote is, in J, Moses has only one son, Gershom, and he takes this son and Zipporah with him to Egypt. This is consistent with the fact that only one son is circumcised in the episode at the lodging place. In E, there is a second son, Eliezer, and Moses does not take his wife and sons with him to Egypt. See the note on Exodus 18, 4. Now, that, that is quite interesting uh, in the context here, so we'll, we'll write these things down. Okay, so to recap what we're going through in J, uh, after Yahweh uh, promised to deliver Israel from Egypt, uh, Yahweh, so the next thing is that Yahweh predicts that Pharaoh won't let them go, but he will strike Egypt with many wonders. And then Israel will be let go and take spoils. And then the next thing is that Yahweh told Moses to go to Egypt. And then the next thing is that Moses took his wife and son to Egypt with him. So that's the next thing. Okay. So notice how this story already is somewhat different from how we're used to just thinking of the story. Like if we watch the movie The Ten Commandments or Prince of Egypt <laughs> or whatever, whatever movie that talks about this Exodus story, we're not used to his father-in-law being called Ruel, he's called Jethro. We're not used to uh, the idea of him taking his wife and Gershom with him. In fact, we might not even be used to Gershom. So these are things that come through in this story, but these are elements that are often ignored in order to harmonize. One moment. So yeah, I think it'd be good to continue then. Maybe you could read verse 20 again of what we just read. And this time, uh, when you read it, read son rather than sons because the idea is that it originally said son and then the editor changed it to sons to kind of harmonize it with the E source, which would be a fairly simple change to do. Um, so you can go from there uh, to... 
the passage in uh, verses 24 to 26. And then you can go to chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And it looks like there's a long section without day there for a while. So maybe only go that far, and then we'll see okay. after that. Okay, so chapter 4, verse 20. And Moses took his wife and his son and rode them on an ass, and he went back to the land of Egypt. Chapter 4, verse 24. And he was on the way at a lodging place, and Yahweh met him, and he asked to kill him. And Zipporah took a flint and cut her son's foreskin and touched his feet, and she said, because you're a bridegroom of blood to me, and he held back from him. Then she said, a bridegroom of blood for circumcisions. Chapter 5, verse 1. And after that, Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Yahweh, God of Israel, said this, let my people go so they will celebrate a festival for me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is Yahweh that I should listen to his voice? to let Israel go. I don't know Yahweh, and also I won't let Israel go. Okay. So what do you guys think? Did that flow well or or what? I thought it did. Yeah, I think it flows well. Uh, one thing about it that's kind of interesting is that Aaron kind of pops up out of nowhere. You know, all of a sudden it's Moses and Aaron did this. Um, so that might seem a little odd because he's not necessarily introduced in a way that explains who he is. It's just he's suddenly in the picture. And so that might seem to say, oh, well, maybe he actually was explained earlier. And who knows, maybe that was part of the J source that got edited out. But the other possibility is that Aaron was just a very well-known figure and there wasn't really a need to explain who he was. Or the author of this source didn't really know his origin or anything like that, but he was well-known enough that he could just mention him. Just like today, someone could write a story in Adventism and just mention certain people without having to really explain who they are. Um, or let's say in the United States, if you're writing American history and you're focusing on one individual, you might tell the details of that individual, but you might have other people who kind of pop into the story and you don't explain who they are because everyone already knows. So that's a possibility for that. Um, any other comments on this? Okay. Um, I don't think we had any footnotes in that part, so let's recap the content, and Teresa will write it down here. So. Uh, after they went you know, on their way to the land of Egypt, the next thing is on their way, they stop at a lodging place and Zipporah circumcises her son. And then the next thing is that Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and, and said, let my people go. So that's kind of the, the high points. I think that's probably good enough for now. Okay, so now we're going to look ahead for the next J passage. <clears throat> 
I think it's all the way to the end of chapter 13, verse 21 of chapter 13. 21 of chapter 13. Yeah, I've looked through here a couple okay. times, and that's the first time I see it. So, yeah, quite a bit gets skipped. Quite a bit indeed. Okay. Um, yeah, if you could read then uh, chapter 5, verse 2, and then, then skip ahead to chapter 13, verse 21, and read just verse... Uh, 21 and 22 of chapter 13, and then we'll stop and see what that's like. Okay. And Pharaoh said, this is chapter 5, verse 2, And Pharaoh said, Who is Yahweh that I should listen to his voice to let Israel go? I don't know Yahweh, and I also won't let Israel go. Chapter 13, verse 21. And Yahweh was going in front of them by day in a column of cloud to show them the way, and by night in a column of fire to shed light for them, so as to go by day and by night. The column of cloud by day and the column of fire by night did not depart in front of the people. Okay. So let me ask you guys, does that one flow? Yeah. Yep. Seems like it to me. I didn't catch yeah. anything. Yeah. I didn't. Okay. Everyone, I'm hearing voices. Everyone's saying, yeah. Um, Maybe read it again? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll read a bit here. And Okay, so, yeah, I'll just read it from chapter 5, verse 2, and then Sigma said to chapter 13, verse 21. And let me, uh, let me know again what, what you think. So chapter 5, verse 2. So again, Moses and Aaron had just said, you know, let my people go and we'll celebrate a festival in the wilderness. Chapter 5, verse 2. And the Pharaoh said, who is Yahweh that I should listen to his voice to let Israel go? I don't know Yahweh, and also I won't let Israel go. And Yahweh was going in front of them by day in a cloud, in a column of cloud, to show them the way, and by night in the column of fire. Okay, well, that's pretty obvious now. I don't know why I missed it the first time. But Pharaoh's not going to let him go, and then all of a sudden they're gone. Yeah, exactly. So that, to me, does not seem like a place where it continues very well, because it basically skips the whole the whole thing of the wonders. Because remember earlier, within the J-Source, mm -hmm. he always said, he won't let you go, but then I will show him, I'll show Egypt my wonders and so on. And then you will go and you'll take spoil with you and all of that. Okay, well, this kind of just skips over all of that and comes to the uh, they're just they're just going <laughs> column in front of them column of cloud by day column of fire by night and yeah and they're just going so that does not seem to to work very well you know so kind of there is a double footnote here. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say I've been double, triple, and quadruple checking that I didn't miss anything in a previous chapter that was between that, and, and I can't find it. I don't believe I did. So, yeah, I think that part is just, you know, obviously that occurrence that happened between Pharaoh saying, no, they're not going, and Yahweh leading them away. <laughs> I don't believe there's anything missed there between chapter 5 and chapter 13. Yeah, yeah, I, I looked at it a few times too and didn't notice anything missed. Um, so I think that that's probably the case. There is actually another book by 
I'm remembering this now, actually, because there is another book by Richard Elliott Friedman called The Hidden Book in the Bible, which is all about the J source, not just in the Pentateuch, but beyond into the books of the Kings. And the whole thing does flow very, very well, but there are a few gaps. And one of them was this place, where there's this gap, where it just skips however much information. And the way that people understand that who advocate the documentary hypothesis is that in the process of editing, some stuff just had to be cut out in order to have some sort of coherent flow. So, you know, that makes sense. If it only, you know, if there's only a few times that are like this, then it can still, the idea can still stand. But obviously, if we found this sort of thing all the time, well, then the whole idea of having narrative continuity starts to fall apart. So that's something to, uh, to keep our eyes out for as part of our test of this. Um, there is a footnote here at the end of chapter 13, verse 22. So I'll read that, and we'll see. I don't know if it has anything to do with this gap in J, but I'll read it anyway. The J and P accounts picture two different scenarios of the event at the sea. In J, while the Egyptians pursue the Israelites... God pushes back the sea with a wind. Then God throws the Egyptian camp into tumult, and when the Egyptians try to flee, they run right into the dried seabed as God releases the seawaters, which return to swallow the fleeing Egyptians. In P, meanwhile, the sea splits, and a, dry, or, and a path of dry ground between walls of water and the Israelites cross through this path. The Egyptians try to cross through this path as well, but the water closes up over them. Both the J and P accounts read as complete stories when the two are separated. The P story repeats details of locations and of the Egyptian forces. P also includes the repeated uh, notation of God's, quote, strengthening Pharaoh's heart. Strengthening Pharaoh's heart is one translation. Hardening Pharaoh's heart is in another. Um, so here he doesn't comment on this gap, but I believe he does in the book, uh, the hidden book in the Bible. Uh, so what I'm thinking to do also is, let's see here. I think it would be good to read a bit more here in Jay. I think we'll only go up to the end of chapter 15 because once it gets to chapter 16, you know, they've crossed the Red Sea and now they're in the wilderness wanderings. And so that goes beyond the scope of Passover necessarily. So... Um, I'm thinking, okay, let's, let's quickly recap what we've gone through, and Teresa can write it down, and then we will read the next part. So, what's the last thing that you have? Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Okay. So, if they go, say, let my people go. Pharaoh basically says, who's Yahweh? I don't know him. Yeah. So Pharaoh refuses. Maybe put that as the next point. Pharaoh refuses. And then, and then Yahweh leads them by... Yeah, say uh, gap, question mark, <laughs> for the next point or whatever. And then say Yahweh leads people in cloud. And pillar of fire. Yeah. 
Okay. So, if you're wanting to keep reading it, I'm cool with that. Um, unless anyone else wants to, that's fine too. Uh, but what we want to do is read from the last verse that we read, chapter 13, verse 22, and then go to chapter 14, verse 5, and then, or the first part of verse 5, and then verse 6, and then there's parts scattered throughout. So, uh... Um, our column card will go out in seven minutes. So, I just want to mention it in case I don't know if you want to call back in now, or if you want to wait until he reads, break it up, and then call back. I could uh, that's probably a good point. Read, or if we I could, could probably read to the end of 14, you know, pretty quick here, and then you could just call back in right after that and go over it. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. You... Okay. Are the verses in 14 still J's? Yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so we're still doing J's, J source. Okay, so the end of chapter 13, verse 22, the column of cloud by day and the column of fire by night did not depart in front of the people. Chapter 14, verse 5, and it was told to the king of Egypt that the people had fled. Moving on to verse 6, and he clenched, I'm sorry, and he hitched his chariot and took his people with him Moving on to the beginning of verse 9. And Egypt pursued him towards the middle of verse 10. And the children of Israel raised their eyes, and here was Egypt coming after them. And they were very afraid. Verse 13. And Moses said to the people, Don't be afraid. Stand still and see Yahweh's salvation that he'll do for you today. For you've seen Egypt today, you'll never see them again, ever. Yahweh will fight for you, and you'll keep quiet. Moving to the middle of 19, and the column of cloud went from in front of them and stood behind them. Verse 20, the middle, and there was the cloud and darkness for the Egyptians, while it, the column of fire, with the night for the Israelites, and one did not come near the other all night. The middle of verse 21, And Yahweh drove back the sea with a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry ground. The beginning of verse 24, And it was in the morning watch that Yahweh gazed at Egypt's camp through a column of fire and cloud, and through Egypt's camp in, into tumult. The middle of verse 25, And Egypt said, Let me flee from Israel, because Yahweh is fighting for them against Egypt. The middle of verse 27, And the sea went back to its strong flow toward morning, and Egypt was fleeing toward it, and Yahweh tossed Egyptians into the sea. Verse 30, and Yahweh saved Israel from Egypt's hand that day, and Israel saw Egypt dead in the seashore, and Israel saw the big hand that Yahweh had used against Egypt, and the people feared Yahweh, and they trusted in Yahweh and in Moses his servant. And that's the end of 14, so we'd be moving on to 15. Uh, after the excellent yeah and let me ask you before we go actually quick what do you guys think did that flow well it does flow well yeah I agree it flows very well and it's actually this is a really good example of this because it skips so much and it's little phrases here and then there and then there and uh, it flows remarkably well. Uh, I notice in verse 10, the middle of verse 10, and then going from there to the beginning of verse 13, actually flows better than it does with the interrupted material. So, yeah, I thought that flowed very well. 
something else I noticed, I don't know if it's that significant or not, but um, you know, after Pharaoh says, who's Yahweh, I'm, I'm not going to let him go, then there's maybe a gap, and then Yahweh leads Israel out, and then Pharaoh learns the Israelites were gone. So according to this, it's not like he knew that they were going to go. So it's not like he did give them permission. It's just that they're gone, and then he learns that they left. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I mean, one way to look at it, in order for there not to be a gap, is that it is like, boom, they suddenly left. And then he finds out they left, and it's like, what? Then he starts to pursue them, and then the crossing of the Red Sea event could be the sign and wonder that Yahweh did in Egypt. That's the other way uh, to view it. Although it still doesn't seem to flow that well, so there might be a gap, but maybe it's not the story that we know. Maybe it's simply, you know, and Moses and Aaron took Israel and fled, and Yahweh guided them in the cloud. So maybe it's just like a simple phrase or something like that. And maybe it just wasn't written that well. That's the other possibility. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about that more a little bit, uh, but we have less than a minute before our calling card cuts out. So we will be right back. Okay, we are back. And we won't stay on too much longer here before we take another break, uh, but it will be good for us to summarize what we just read and also footnotes. So let me see here. Um, Okay, at uh, the end of the J phrase in the middle of chapter 14, verse 21, and the phrase here again, it says, And Yahweh drove back the sea with a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry ground. So then there's a footnote right there. It says, In the J Red Sea story, the Hebrew uses the same term for dry ground, Harabah, that is used in the J flood story, Genesis 7, verse 22. Meanwhile, in the P Red Sea story, the Hebrew uses the same term for dry ground, Yabasa, that is used in the P flood and creation story, Genesis 1, verses 9, 10, and Genesis 8, verse 14. Okay, and that's the end of the notes there. Um, okay, so let's take note of the events. So after the cloud, Pharaoh is told that the people fled, which is interesting. They fled. It's not that he let them go. So that is quite interesting. They fled, and then he followed them with his chariot. And then the next thing is Israel saw him, saw Egypt, and became afraid. Next, Moses told them, don't be afraid. And promised salvation. Next, the cloud moved. In between the two camps? Yeah. Dark on one side, light on the other. Exactly. Dark on one side, light on the other. And then, next is Yahweh drove back the sea. Next is Yahweh threw the camp of Egypt into a tumult. And then next, uh, Yahweh 
throws them into the sea. Great. And uh, then I, I think that's it for the, the main points. Uh, it is interesting, though, that it says, Yahweh saved Israel from Egypt's hand that day, and Israel saw Egypt dead on the seashore. That's different from the picture that we normally have, where they're dead at the bottom of the sea. According to this, it was on the shore. And also, they're you know they're thrown into the sea instead of being covered by actually. Probably don't want to. We'll probably cover this later, but but um you know obviously the story we're used to is that the sea you know came back over them. There is there you know the sea was parted, and then while they were maybe halfway across, all of a sudden the sea closes back up. But in this version, they were thrown into the sea. Yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, so these are the sorts of things that we notice just reading it like this, where, hey, wait a second. When we're not trying to harmonize it, we actually pay attention to what these verses actually say. Just like in the, the flood story, reading it, it with the separate uh, versions, we actually notice that, oh, hey, in one of them, it actually says two of every unclean animal, but seven of every clean. But in the other, it says two of every animal, both clean and unclean. Well, it just stands out a lot more clearly when we read it according to its independent sources because we're not trying to harmonize these discrepancies with each other. So that's really interesting. Um, I'm looking at this too, and I'm seeing... Chapter 15 is almost all J, and it is singing the song that is known as the Song of the Sea, otherwise known as the Song of Miriam. And this is supposed to be a very old uh, song. Some people say it's uh, the oldest composition, period, in the Hebrew Bible. Very old, perhaps even going back to the 15th century BCE, or the 12th century BC, depending on how you date it, and which is the time of the Exodus. So this might actually go back to that time. Um, so we could actually not read it we, and basically stop here, take a break for half an hour or however long we should take a break, and then come back and read the first 14 chapters again but all according to the e-source. So what, what do you guys think of doing that? Can I ask a question first? Sure. Um, Ed mentioned um, something about the Lord throwing him into the sea, and I thought, well, where did it say that? And so while you were talking, I, I did find it, but I don't read it that way. I, I'm not sure if I could hear it again in that other source, but just the um, King James says, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, which doesn't change anything in my mind as far as thinking that in the middle of the sea, that's where you know the water probably did go over them. Um, so... Is it written differently in what you had, Ed, or how, how do you read it? I mean, I don't understand it, it that did. way. It just uh, is overthrown is in my Bible. Um, okay, I'll read that again. And just an, another interesting point along with this being thrown into the sea, which we haven't gotten to or we're actually talking about not going into, but in this song that Trent's talking about in Chapter 15, one yeah. of the lines is there in there, I think it's verse 4, yeah. Chapter 15, verse 4 is Pharaoh's chariots and his army he plunged in the sea and the choice of his troops drowned in the Red Sea. So there's another place where they were, I, I don't. I guess you could take that a couple different ways, but anyway, 
and that's obviously you know that's part of the J source. But um, it was chapter 14, verse 27 in the middle um, right. that we had read earlier. And the sea went back to its strong flow toward morning. So in other words, the sea is back in its normal position, right? And Egypt was fleeing toward it, and Yahweh tossed the Egyptians into the sea. Hmm. Yeah, that's really different than what I'm seeing here. Just sounds like they got middle ways and and read, the Lord read your over. Way. Yeah, read your version. Good. Okay, um, Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And then it says, and the waters returned and covered the chariot and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh. That came in the sea after them. So they yes, were in the sea. Chapter 28 is part of the J source, though. Yeah. Yeah, I, was, I went into 28. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out because it was, uh, it made it I, a I think bit. that they were consistent, though, Lynn, because like, like that first part, you said that, you know, the sea went back, I, I forget how the wording was, but similar to back to its strong flow toward morning. So in the morning, the sea had returned. You know, it was no longer parted. The Egyptians were fleeing toward the sea that had already returned to its normal, you know, characteristic. And then the Egyptians end up into the sea. So they were, you know, here it says mm-hmm. tossed and yours, I, I forget the word. So says the Lord over, yeah, mine says the Lord over them, yeah. Yeah. In the midst of the sea. You know, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Uh, we were just on mute as as you guys were talking about that, and, and Teresa just mentioned how, in the light of the other source, it makes it look like they were, you know, drowned in the middle of the sea, and you know, it says and the waters went back and covered the chariots and and so on and so forth. But that's only when you include the parts from the other source. But when you read it, like Ed's pointing out, I think it's a really good point that no matter which translation, the first sentence there where it says, and the sea went back to its strong flow toward morning, uh, you know, whether it's in one translation or another, it still describes the sea going back to where it was before the Egyptians dying by means of the sea, whatever that looks like. Even before they go toward the sea. Yeah, you're right, even before they go toward it. So first it's returned to its original state, then they're fleeing toward it, and then Yahweh either tosses them into it or whatever it may be, so that it really shows it's not like they're in the middle of it and it's open and then it crashes onto them. It goes back to its normal state and then they are either plunged into it, tossed into it, or whatever. And then the other part, I'm interested to see, uh, maybe, Mom, you could read this in the King James, verse 30, because here it says, And Yahweh saved Israel from Egypt's hand that day, and Israel saw Egypt dead on the seashore. I'm, you know, it doesn't say that they were at the bottom of the sea and they couldn't be seen. It's they saw them dead on the seashore. I'm really interested. Uh, what does the King James say on that? Mm-hmm. It's a similar, and and I and I also want to agree. You know, after when you uh, repeated that about the sea returning and then the Egyptians. Yeah, I, I'd like to go back to that. And the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it. So yes, it did come after the um, sea returned to its strength, and then um, then it says the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And then jumping down to verse thirty, like you, um, it was thirty, right? Yeah, it says the thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. So it's almost exactly like the other one. Um, because they couldn't have seen them if they were at the bottom of the sea, although some of them could have washed up. Well, you know, I'm not saying they couldn't have 
been at the bottom of the sea and be washing up on the shore, and that's all the Egyptians saw was the ones that were washed up on the shore. It doesn't mean there weren't some in you know, right. the bottom of the sea. This, this reminds me of uh, when it comes to the Gospels in the New Testament, there are ways that people could harmonize things, like, oh, well, maybe, you know, like you're saying, oh, it's, it's possible. And it's not to say that it's never the case that maybe that is the true answer, but we end up with our own whole separate story, hey? <laughs> because it's, it's just like in the Gospels. In one Gospel, Judas dies by hanging himself. In another Gospel, Judas dies by falling and hitting his... Or not falling, no, he, he dies by... Uh, Something like his stomach opens or something? Well, no, that's, that is the combined version. That's not in any gospel. No. So while well, just saying the combined version. But in one gospel, he hangs himself. In another gospel, he dies and spills his blood on, in some valley, and it gets a certain name. And what people do is, well, obviously, he's hanging himself, and then he falls and, and you know, dies in that way. Well, but the, the interesting thing is that that version that we come up with isn't stated in any of them. So we basically come up with our own version by combining them. And it's, just, it's an interesting thing that happens all the time in the Gospels. And, you know, it could easily happen here too, but it's less likely to happen here for us to do that because the text has already done that for us by combining them. But... Um, you know, so I, I would just mention that to point out the the way of of approaching it, and, it, and I'm not saying that what you're saying, Mom, isn't true. I mean, it, yeah, sure, it's possible. Maybe some of them were on the shore, some of them were at the bottom of the sea. It's not impossible, but the only reason why we might suggest that is to try and harmonize the sources rather than just letting each source speak for itself. Basically, in one, they're at the seashore, and the other, they're drowned in the bottom of the sea. So what's the reason, um, verse 29, not being in this J source? Because see, verse 29 says, uh, the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And then it says, the Lord saved them, What's the reason we can't necessarily um, at least what's the reason we can't take take that to be that they were um, uh, covered with water in the midst of the sea? Because well, see, in the verse, okay. verse 29 is evidently part of a different source, a different story. So in other words, that isn't actually part of the same writing even as verse, you know, the middle of verse 27 and then verse 30. So it's true that verse 29 does say that they're in the middle of the sea and it's opened and there's a wall on both sides and all of that. But the point is that's one story and that's not the story of the J text. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Which actually, this sort of thing, I think, is one of the evidences of the fact that there are different texts because you have these different stories and in order to make them the same, you end up having to ignore what one or the other of them actually says. And so I, I find that actually very fascinating. Um, I do want to ask as well, just because I know that this song here does deal with this, this whole thing. Um, you know, Ed, you mentioned something from it already. I don't know if you, if you guys all want to read it or not. But, um, you know, I mean, it might not be necessary. There is a lot to cover. Um, and the other option is everyone could just read it on their own afterward from verses 1 to verse 18. 
is also uh, part of the J source. Um, but I'm open to uh, whatever everyone wants to do. So what do you guys think? I don't think it's that necessary to read it. I, I just, it, it always bothered me, that, you know, that word plunged. And I, I forget what the other version I was reading before was, but I, I just remember it like not being consistent with the sea closing in on them, you know, plunged meant like they were put into the sea. Um, or that's how I had taken it in the past and it just wasn't congruent, you know, and this makes it all make sense, you know, that there's, there's separate sources. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. So what I'm thinking now then is that we'll take a break and um, come back and start reading from the e-source uh, from chapter 1 to chapter 14. How does that sound to you guys? Sounds good. Sounds good here. It's fine. Okay, so... I'm thinking just to keep things at a nice even time. Uh, in Easter time, it's 321 right now, and I'm thinking what we could do is have a break and then come back at 4. Does that sound good to you guys? Sounds good. Okay, excellent. I'll post that on Facebook. All right, well, thank you, Heavenly Family, and uh, bless our studies. Toda, thanks. See you in about 40 minutes. All right, shalom. 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 Shalom.